I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Welcome to a special edition of Bloomberg Technology. We are covering this Earth Day with a hard look at the challenges facing our planet and bringing you some solutions to protecting it. We're speaking with Google Sustainability Officer Kate Brandt, JB Straubel, former Tesla CTO, who's now working to create a circular economy for electric cars and gadgets of all kinds, and Marco Strutt of Genesis Digital Assets from how Google uses satellite images to track climate change to the debate around Bitcoin mining. We have a fascinating hour ahead. And separately, I'll be speaking with Warner Media CEO Jason Kylar in an exclusive interview. He is making some of the most controversial moves in OTT and remaking HBO as he goes. This all on a day when U.S. markets fell. As we learn, President Biden is weighing a capital gains tax on the wealthy as high as 43.4%. The president also opening a global climate summit. First, though, how, to mar how markets finish the day. Let's get to a picture of how EV stocks performed and overall markets with our Ed Ludlow. Ed, take it away. Yeah, really the main catalyst was the Biden plan, according to sources, to raise capital gain tax to beyond 43%. The worry being that the richest investors would be hardest hit and that they may sell assets do trading ahead of that policy coming in. The S&P 500, the main gauge of U.S. equities, had been higher earlier in the session, down by less than 1%, but still the biggest drop in more than a month. And it was also felt kind of quite broadly. Some of the biggest points decline is big names like Apple, Amazon, Tesla uh, as well. Interesting, though, the other big story, the Biden and White House commitment to halve greenhouse emissions by 2030. You feel that felt in sort of renewable energy stocks, solar, fuel cell, fuel cell energy up by just a tenth of 1%, but big gains in solar edge technologies, Ballard power systems up by 1.3%. Flip up the boards again, EV stocks was another story. What's interesting is there wasn't that much support for the EV sector, despite White House commitments to accelerate the pace of EV adoption, invest more money into charging infrastructure. Tesla down by more than 3%. And in a report from Consumer Reports that they were able to trick a Model Y SUV into driving under autopilot without anybody in the front seat following that fatal crash in Texas on Saturday. Fisker down by 9% after a rating card at Goldman Sachs. Lawstown Motors feeling the pressure down half a percent. But Nikola Corp, Nikola, this company that I've been covering in and out for 12 months, up 14% after securing a deal with a partner for hydrogen infrastructure here in California. The idea being you go to a service station and fill up your big semi truck with hydrogen fuel. Really feeling the love. Huge gain, biggest gain since March, up 14%. And one final time, a sector we're watching, the streamers, under pressure since Netflix reported on Tuesday. The worry here is that Netflix is the poster child for the end of the stay-at-home stock surge. We know that they missed estimates on new subscribers, but that pain still being felt throughout other streaming platforms, some of Netflix rivals. And I know that's something you're going to talk about in the show today. Emily. All right, Ed. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Now, sticking with streaming, we've been watching AT&T's results. Of course, the parent company of Warner Media, where HBO Max continues to rack up subscribers, now at 44.2 million. Warner Media also enjoying a huge run at the box office with Godzilla versus Kong. Warner Media CEO Jason Kylar joining me now in an exclusive interview. Jason, so good to have you on the show. Thank you. You are launching a new ad-supported version of HBO Max that is coming in June at a lower price point, and you have been making some of the most controversial moves in OTT. What gives you so much conviction that this is the right strategy, and how many subscribers do you think you can rack up there? Well, I'll answer your, your second question first, Emily, which is, I think that the ceiling on, on OTT is, is much higher than most people uh, are talking about today. If you look at the number of people that are on the planet uh, and the fact that um, everyone loves to be moved through story, um, I think the ceiling is a lot more than several hundred million paying subscribers, which is what most people are talking about when it comes to over-the-top services. So, um, so we're playing for the long game and, and for a ceiling that's much, much higher than that. Um, and then to your first question, Emily, about conviction is that 
you know, we have conviction because we're focused on the customer. Um, and, and because we're focused on that first and foremost, um, it gives us confidence to make decisions like bringing movies day and date to both HBO Max and in theaters uh, during this pandemic. Um, if you start with the customer and just sort of try and invent uh, with them in mind, good things tend to happen. And, and that's why we have conviction. So you have well-resourced and very prolific competitors. Do you think you have enough content to keep up with Disney and Netflix? I, I do, and, I, and I, I'm smiling just because in my head right now, I've got things like going through my head like the DC universe of Gotham and Metropolis and Westeros from Game of Thrones and The Matrix and Looney Tunes, and, and, and I haven't even gotten to HBO and the incredible storytelling that that team does. Um, you know, you're looking at a 98-year history of, of a company that's built up muscles and strength and, and breadth in terms of people from Warner Brothers Television to documentary filmmakers at CNN and everything in between. So I feel really, really good about what we're doing and what we're able to do on the road ahead. Meantime, you're having a killer run at the box office, even in the middle of a pandemic with Godzilla versus Kong number one for several weeks in a row. Then you've got Mortal Kombat out this weekend. What are your expectations? Um, well, hopefully more of the same. Uh, um, you know, with Mortal Kombat opening tomorrow in theaters around the world, um, we're super excited. The early response from those that have been fortunate to see you know, sneak uh, screenings has been incredibly positive. And so uh, here in the U.S. market, literally at midnight tonight, people are going to be able to start to see it in theaters and on HBO Max. And, uh, and if you spend any time on social media, it's just electric right now in terms of, you know, all the trailers and all the excitement. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit giddy because I know the next 24 hours are going to be quite fun for us as a company. Well, speaking of electric, you took a lot of heat for deciding to simultaneously release movies in theaters and on HBO Max. And I'm curious if you feel vindicated right now and what your relationship is with the producers and talent and studio execs in Hollywood. You know, it, it's a fair question, but, you know, as background, I'm one of six kids. And so I've taken a lot of shots growing up uh, as a kid in Pittsburgh. And so so the response that, that, that we received uh, in terms of, of, of what was seen as a controversial decision to bring you know, movies to HBO Max and theaters at the same time, um, it was one of those things where we certainly anticipated that there would be those folks that um, you know, kind of wanted to share their strong opinions on it because change is hard, and, and we get that. Um, but at the same standpoint, we did have conviction in that decision because it was um, one that had a unique set of circumstances, obviously, with the pandemic, and it started and ended with the fan. And so we do feel good about the decision, but um, you know, we're not taking any victory laps because you know, this is a, a very long adventure that we're on, and I think it's going to be measured in decades, not, not months. Um, um, but you're absolutely right that it seems like the industry has come around to candidly where we were last fall, and, and, and that's, that's nice to see. Uh, it, 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 sort of, it certainly doesn't define us, but it's nice to see. So let's talk about the 2022 strategy then. It sounds like you're going to release big movies just in theaters, but how many and how big? So there's going to be, so Warner Brothers, we're going to invest in more motion pictures than we have historically. So Warner Brothers, um, uh, which is a, a broad and deep bench of incredible executives and obviously work with the finest storytellers in the world, they're going to be uh, investing in telling more stories through motion pictures. And there's going to be a portion of those motion pictures that will go directly to HBO Max, and they will be made available to exhibitors around the world, just like you see this year. And there will also be um, a, a, a set of motion pictures. Think of like the DC titles, you know, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, uh, things like that, that will have an exclusive run, albeit a shorter run than it has historically been the case. And then they will show up on HBO Max. So, so Warner Brothers is going to be busier than they ever have been before in terms of motion pictures. And you will see uh, literally two different types of distribution strategies for those pictures. Meantime, the streaming war is a global one. Talk to us about the international rollout of HBO Max. Has it been a challenge to negotiate with so many different parties in so many different countries around the world? It, it hasn't necessarily been um, hard on that level. There's been a lot of challenges, Emily, for sure, uh, you know, because you, you obviously want to make sure you're being thoughtful in every single market. You want to produce um, uh, stories um, for a given audience, and we've been doing that for decades, thankfully, and we're obviously leaning into that. Um, there's technology involved in terms of specific payment processes that are unique to a given market, um, but we're really excited, and, and we've been hard at work on this. And so, as you know, we're in one market today, which is the U.S. market. 
but literally within a couple of months, we're going to be in an additional 39. Uh, so we'll be in 40 countries by the end of June. And then there's another 21 that are coming literally in the months after that in the second half of the year. So, so we're just getting started and we're very, very excited about becoming a global service. All right, Jason, so good to have you here on, on Bloomberg Technology. We'll be watching the debut of, of Mortal Kombat this weekend and uh, uh, keep an eye on your strategy. Jason Kylar, CEO of Warner Media. Thank you. All right, coming up, we're going to take you on a journey to show you what happens to your electric car and its battery when you're done with it and one company that's giving them new life. That's next. And later in the hour, we have he has 24.9 million followers on TikTok, 2 million views per video. We're gonna to talk to Josh Richards about his fame on the platform Life Beyond Social Media and why he's getting into VC investing with Marshall Sandman, formerly of Goldman Sachs, as we continue our TikTok series and as we head to break. Enjoy my very first TikTok when it was Musical.ly, which I shot with the co-founder, Alex Jew. I haven't seen this in years, but there you have it. Me and Alex, this is Bloomberg. President Biden invited 40 world leaders to the White House this Earth Day in efforts to underscore the urgency and the economic benefits of stronger climate action. As global CO2 emissions continue to rise, climate change is pressing companies of all kinds, and especially car makers, to do more to do their part. Corporations like Tesla and QuantumScape are on a race to develop more efficient batteries in hopes electric cars will soon replace their gas-guzzling counterparts, but as batteries replace engines, concerns are also rising about the negative impact old and poorly recycled batteries have on our environment. Redwood Materials is a company that's focused on the recycling of lithium ion batteries and electric, electronic waste and is looking to tackle these problems. The company was started by CEO J.B. Straubel, who was also Tesla's first chief technology officer and a co-founder and saw an opportunity to give batteries another life. His company breaks down old batteries to recycle the cobalt, lithium, nickel, and other raw ingredients that can almost be recycled endlessly. With me now to discuss the process and how he went from Tesla to Redwood is JB Srabel himself. JB, thank you so much for joining us. You know, many people think if they're driving a Tesla, they're doing their part to help the environment, but it's not so simple, is it? Well, they, they definitely are doing their part, but um, you know it, it is uh, important that we consider you know the full life cycle and, and including the end of life and even where the materials came from to make the car. So, talk to us then about why you know what happens um, when those batteries need to be disposed of and why the process that you are tackling is so important. Well, the, the materials that go into the battery and the battery itself is, is the biggest single component in an electric car. And, you know, it, it both gives it its performance and range, but, you know, it also, you know, carries a lot of the embedded emissions and, and um, you know, creates a bit of a challenge at end of life. You know, it has to be disposed of properly. So, you know, what we do is, is work on inventing the right ways, you know, using chemistry and, and different chemical engineering processes to sort of unmanufactured to take apart the battery at end of life um, when it you know can't have any more functional use and as quickly as possible as efficiently as possible get the metals and the, the critical materials right back into the manufacturing supply chain so that we can offset new materials being mined so talk to us about how the process of recycling a battery works in in layman's terms well, the, the first step is, um, you know, actually getting it to us and getting it to the facility to do this, which, you know, can actually be a bit of a challenge when the batteries are smaller or, you know, if it's a cell phone or a consumer battery, you know, much like most people probably have in a pile in their drawer somewhere at home, you know, so, you know, we work uh, with different shipping technologies and, and methods to, to help aggregate and move those batteries to us. You know, then we do some sorting and, and you know, understand how to group different chemistries. You know, that also can be a bit challenging and there's some interesting automated sorting technology. And then kind of the next step is, is using that chemistry 
the chemistry differences between those critical metals, you know, to separate the nickel and the lithium and, and cobalt from each other so that we can create uh, sort of the building blocks, the, the raw materials to begin remanufacturing new batteries. What about the critics who say that it takes non-renewable power to power these recycling plants? Well, you know, there's a, there's definitely a lot. It's important, I think, you know, in any case to look at, you know, how a process is powered and what its impact is. But, you know, we've taken a, a pretty careful view on this and, um, you know, in, in every way we look at it, it's far more sustainable to recycle an old material, an old battery, and recover that into new materials, um, you know, versus, you know, mining them from, from uh, you know, essentially, you know, from brand new materials from the earth. Um, you know, we have lower emissions and lower energy input. Um, and also we're avoiding the, the disposal problem of the end of life. So it's kind of, you know, almost two, two, two wins in one environmentally where, you know, we offset the impact of new materials and we solve the disposal problem of the battery itself. Now, you know, President Biden is working on a whole climate plan. What would you like to see from the Biden administration in terms of a policy to encourage more car makers and consumer electronics makers to recycle? Do you think this should be a requirement? Well, I, I think ultimately it, it should be, and I think ultimately it will be a requirement um, to recycle old EV batteries. But, you know, I, I also think that um, it would be very helpful to start, you know, putting a framework around how we think about uh, the energy and the emissions that go into these batteries when they're made. And, you know, that is a very key part of recycling because, you know, when you recycle the materials and reuse them, um, we're able to increase the, the recycled content percent of a battery, if you think of it this way. It's sort of a familiar concept, you know, for paper and plastic, but uh, it applies very similarly to a battery. And when a goal of a, of a product like an electric vehicle is, you know, to reduce emissions and to, you know, uh, you know cause a positive shift on, on you know, climate change, um, it's really important, you know, how that product is made and to make sure that not only the energy that charges it, but the energy that, that makes it uh, and the materials that make it um, are all done as sustainably as possible. All right. J.B. Straubel, fascinating um, what you're working on. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. J.B. Straubel, co-founder and CEO of Redwood Materials. All right, coming up, Google has 24 million satellite images of the globe taken over the last 37 years. The image is offering a photographic record of the realities of climate change. More next as our Earth Day coverage continues. This is Bloomberg. covered a lot of ground. The global search engine, very dependent on data storage, operates data centers all over the world. But this doesn't come without a price. Data centers consume a lot of energy, so it's no small feat that Google has become the first major company to be carbon neutral. I spoke with Google sustainability officer Kate Brandt about how the company will maintain this commitment and what they're doing to work towards being carbon free. Data centers are really very much at the heart and soul of Google's operations of the internet itself. And so we operate data centers all over the world uh, that make products, be it your Gmail, your YouTube, or Google Cloud, which is all the services that we can provide to our business customers. They make all of these products possible. And data centers do require a lot of energy to operate. And so that is why we have been committed to operating as a carbon neutral company since 2007. Now, last year, Google offset its entire historical carbon footprint, dating all the way back to your founding in 1998. How on earth did you do that? That's exactly right. So our approach to carbon neutrality has been threefold. We first want to be as energy efficient as possible, and we're doing things like using Google's own AI technology to do that. 
then we're committed to matching 100% of our electricity use with renewable energy. And then third, we use high quality carbon offsets. So last year, as a part of an announcement our CEO Sindar made of our third decade of climate action, we also shared that we have gone all the way back to 1998 and neutralized our carbon footprint through the purchase of high quality carbon offsets. But also this is only just the beginning. We made an even bigger moonshot commitment as well. So speaking of moonshots, and of course, Google is known for moonshots, your latest one is to get to 24-7 carbon-free energy by 2030. How likely is it that you can get there? Yes. So carbon-free 2030 is our new moonshot. And what this means is that we're really trying to move from today's strategy of what we would call kind of compensate and remove carbon to actually an absolute zero, where our operations are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week on clean energy. And so what that will mean is every time you send a Gmail, every time you watch a YouTube video, that is supplied by clean energy every hour of every day. And we're very excited to share on Earth Day that five of our data center sites around the world in Denmark, Finland, Iowa, Oklahoma, and Oregon are already operating at about 90% plus carbon-free energy, which definitely puts us on track to meet our 2030 commitment. Google now has multiple products that more than a billion people use. You recently announced eco-friendly routes on Google Maps, a huge update to Google Earth called Time Lapse. What's next? Yes, so you know we are so privileged that we have multiple products that over a billion people use every day. And as part of this third decade of climate action, we've made a commitment that we want to enable a billion people to take new actions by 2022 through our products. So you mentioned eco routes. This was really one of the most exciting new pieces of news on this front. We shared a few weeks ago that in the US later this year, Google Maps is gonna automatically default to the lowest carbon emissions footprint route, assuming it has roughly the same ETA. Um, and then you also mentioned Google Earth time lapse. This is an incredible tool uh, that we just launched a refresh of. We have 24 million satellite images from the last 37 years. And what you can do is go to time lapse and see how has the surface of the Earth changed over that time. Um, we know that these kind of poignant images have played a really critical role in the environmental movement. You know, we think about Earthrise, for example, and we see time lapse as that's playing that same role, giving people really a visceral understanding of our planet, the impact we've had, but also hope that not only are we seeing glaciers drying up, but we're also seeing, you know, forests being protected, large shell scale solar farms coming online. Um, so these are just two examples of the direction that we're heading in terms of really putting our products in service of sustainability. Kate Brandt there, Google's sustainability officer. You can catch the full interview at Bloomberg.com. All right, coming up, Josh Richards is one of the highest paid TikTok content creators, now turned venture capitalist. He'll join us with Marshall Salmon next to talk about new platform opportunities. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. I want to get a quick update on the markets and the tech movers of the day with Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta. Kriti, walk us through the day. Well, Emily, that capital gain story, that's really what's been weighing on the broader benchmarks. But of course, tech is the one that really got hit hard. Just take a look at this New York Fang Index, those uh, index that houses those big tech heavyweights. Seeing some pain as is that semiconductors index, the SOX index down 2.3% on the day. And of course, relative to the S&P 500, only down just shy of 1%. You can really see that pain is in big tech. And of course, you see that NASDAQ volatility up to a 24 handle as well. Once again, big tech was the main loser in the story. Flip up the board. And I want to show you some of those individual movers. Let's just start in the middle right there. Snapchat actually down 2.1%. Uh, but even after you're starting to see, and this of course was intraday, so this was before those earnings came out, but you actually did see Snapchat report stronger user growth numbers, stronger sales as well. Pinterest though, slightly isolated. And the reason I bring that to your attention is because Snapchat took a massive hit, Twitter took a massive hit, but Pinterest, which usually trades in line with both, not as much of a big loss. And of course, those ETFs, those drive, excuse me, the drive ETF, the ETF that holds those electric vehicles still not hit as hard as some of those other big tech heavyweights. Slip up the boards one last time. And let me show you the other pieces of the tech universe. Of course, we saw those Chinese ADRs 
Alibaba, Baidu, that's in that index. Actually in the green, once again, isolated from that domestic tax story. NASDAQ biotech index under some pressure, but once again, not to the same extent as those aforementioned stocks. And then lastly, the small caps also isolated from that story. This is really a big company, a big market cap story. Small caps uh, a little bit more protected in that scenario. Emily? All right, Kriti, thanks for walking us through all that. Appreciate it. Well, TikTok definitely benefited from a global lockdown with so many of us looking for a window to the outside world. But remember, it was already a household name before the pandemic and is now really the social network and voice of Gen Z. One content creator benefiting from that boom is Josh Richards, who also has a huge following on Instagram and YouTube. On TikTok alone, he has 24.9 million followers. Each of his videos getting an average of 2 million views. He's among the top paid content creators on the platform with high-end sponsorships, podcast deals, and even some of his own new entrepreneurial endeavors. And less than a month ago, Josh, along with other content creators, Griffin Johnson and Noah Beck, partnered with Marshall Sandman and Michael Gruen to launch Animal Capital, the first Gen Z-focused venture capital fund with digital creator Megastars at the founder level. The fund will focus on consumer and financial technology, health, wellness, media, both Josh and Marshall joining us now. Gentlemen, so great to have you. Uh, Josh, my producer Jackie, is giddy in the control room that you are here with us today. Uh, but Marshall, I want to start with you because you started your career as a Goldman analyst. Why decide to focus exclusively on Gen Z? How big do you think this opportunity is? And are other investors missing this? Um, it's monumental. And first of all, thank you so much for having us. Josh and I are super appreciative to be here. Uh, it means a lot to both of us. Um, it's, it's monumental, honestly. I, I think that you know, for me to have the opportunity to partner with someone like uh, you know, folks like Josh, as well as Griffin and, and Noah and Michael on this, um, it's a completely unique opportunity. The market is not 100% untapped, but it is 100% untapped in terms of Folks like them who aren't just, you know, aren't just sitting with their fingers on the pulse of Gen Z, but are the pulse of Gen Z to affect investment outcomes, to improve the lives and performances of founders, to connect them in a really organic, uh, thoughtful way with their with consumers uh, to drive business outcomes is it's awesome, uh, and it's something that was, was you know, a com completely you know, fantastic career opportunity for me. And honestly, I I'm just glad that that you know Josh and, and Michael and I got along so well that this. It took took off like a uh, you know like like a gun here. It was fantastic. So Josh, you're just 19 years old, 25 million followers on TikTok, 7.4 million on Instagram, 2.4 million on YouTube. How did you grow that following? Yeah, just ever since the start of doing social media, I, I, I've been a competitive person my whole life, and I decided very early on whatever I was going to do, I was going to be the best at it. So. I set goals when I started social media I, of making it to 10,000 followers by the end of a summer. I had signed up my sister and put her on a 15% commission-based salary, and I treated it exactly like a business right from the get-go. So I think just looking for white spaces in the social media scene, and that was live streaming at the time back in uh, the summer of 2016 when I first started, and it's really studying the For You page, it, it just allowed me to realize what I needed to do, tackle that space, and then uh, just move forward with it. Marshall, so many people, most of them older than Josh, don't understand this new world, don't understand what the opportunity is. By having folks like him at the founder level, how are they influencing the decisions you're making, where you're placing your bets, where, what you think the next hot thing will actually be? Um, you know, you know, I think that the, the, the first thing to, to point out, and I don't, I don't mean to, to gas Josh up too much is you don't have a lot of, um, you know, folks, you know, creators like Josh who are not just so enterprising, but are this hardworking in order to, to capitalize on this opportunity. So I think in terms of, you know, in terms of answering your question, I, I, I think that the, we have a real opportunity to affect business outcomes here. So, you know, and Josh and I talk about this all the time, but for me, I'm getting in, I'm doing a fundamental sort of you know, uh, bottoms up, top down analysis of some of these businesses, addressing the product market fit, thinking about the total addressable market, thinking about margin expansion and customer acquisition costs, et cetera. And then when it comes time for us to you know, do meetings, you know, me, Josh, Griffin, founders, uh, there has to be a sexiness to it. There has to be something that stands out about 
that product or service and what oftentimes is a really crowded space for us to want to believe in them, for us to want to, you know, for us to want to go to war with them and, and to drive um, you know, their, their business across, not just you know, Josh and Griffin and Noah's audience, but across you know, the, you know, the entire you know, you know, multiple socio uh, sociodemographic um, you know, uh, group, groups of folks across the country and, and the world. So, Josh, there are so many young people out there who want to know how you did it, who want to do what you do, going from, you know, some viral videos to uh, sponsorship deals and podcasts and becoming an operating partner at a VC firm. Walk us through how you made that happen. Yeah, I mean, I've always just focused on expanding into different categories and verticals. I've really made it part of my career that I'm able to pivot and I'm able to add depth. So for all those other social media influencers out there, what I've tried to do is is lead the way or set a path so that they don't have to be held to those stigmas anymore. They don't have to be told what they can and cannot do. I think being in this space, a lot of the times we're labeled as uh, social media creators and that's all we can be. But I'm trying to obviously prove everyone wrong and I am doing that. So I think more than anything, I'm just trying to be a be a voice for the social media creators in the world that have aspirations to be more than just a face on it uh, on a screen. Now, Marshall, clearly the audience that Josh and other stars have built is massive, but there's always something bright and shiny around the corner. Do you worry at all about this kind of fame being fleeting? Do you worry at all about the next TikTok? Um, I, I would be remiss to say we didn't talk about it. I'm not. I'm not super worried that it is right around the corner or tomorrow. I think that doing it's exactly what Josh said. I, th I think it's you know, de destigmatizing. Uh, you know, just you know, just being a social media post for you know for Josh. It's not just folks like Josh that want to be venture capitalists, but it can be influencers that want to consult for companies and do other things for them. Um, and so. Yes, I, I think I think that sometimes social media fame is fleeting, but when you build, when you do what Josh and I are doing with our sort of small and, and hopefully growing enterprise by putting tent poles under the different pieces of these business to create real structure, uh, we won't just be relevant, um, you know, in Josh's you know late teens and twenties. We're going to be relevant in our third and our fourth and our fifth fund by continuing to point out those trends and working with younger talent and talent that addresses you know di uh, addresses different demographics you know, over the course of time. Well, and I wonder if we're seeing the emergence of the next generation of investors. Josh, you know, knowing that, how do you plan to keep growing your audience, knowing that there are so many folks out there competing for our time? You know, how do you get new followers? How do you continue to build the following you have? I really pride myself in doing things that no one would expect. I think, I mean, even doing interviews on Bloomberg is something that a lot of people would not expect a social media creator to do or be able to do. So that's how I continue to grow. That's how I continue to stay in front of people's eyes is every day coming out or, or every month coming out with something that's going to make people go, how? Or, or, you know, the term we usually use, I'm not allowed to say on TV because it has a cuss word in it, but what the F, you know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> I think as long as I'm able to keep making people um, stay on their toes and, and wonder what Josh Richards' next move is going to be, uh, I'm, I'm always going to be relevant and I'm always going to be in the scene. Thanks for keeping it PG for us, Josh. We spoke yeah, to course. Katie Feeney yesterday. She said, <laughs> she said she's still planning to go to college. She wants to study business. Do you think you need to go to college? What's your long-term plan? Yeah, so I think that when we talk about the new generation and these new paths that I'm creating, I don't think that the college route is for everyone. I think that that's become something that's a lot more acceptable too in today's world. Uh, when I even look back to when I was 12 or 13 and, and creating these small businesses and companies in my basement, my parents still had the aspirations that I was going to go to college and be a lawyer or whatever I decided to be. But uh, as time moved on, I mean, my parents were first to realize, you know what, this kid doesn't need to go to college. This kid will be very, very successful in the, the, the ventures he continues to go down and strive for. So not only am I hoping to, to break stigmas in the social media world or, or pave new paths there, but in everyday lives, I think that there's a lot of high school students out there that can go right out of high school and, and co-found uh, a company. So I hope that I'm able to put that faith in a lot of people.
All right. Well, we'll be watching you on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, and whatever is coming next. Um, really fascinating work that both of you are doing. Josh Richards and Marshall Salmon of Animal Capital, thanks so much for stopping by. And just a reminder, you can check out our Bloomberg Tech podcast, Foundering, focusing on the TikTok story, the TikTok phenomenon. Find that podcast. It is out today on Apple, Spotify, Bloomberg, and wherever you get your podcasts. Check it out. Coming up, Intel out with first quarter results. It is not a rosy picture. Declines in sales, gross margin, signaling a loss in market share to rivals. We're going to break down the numbers next. This is Bloomberg. SAP's cloud unit had a blowout quarter driven by its program to migrate more customers to a newer suite of products and to the cloud. This, as Europe's largest tech company, embarks on a turnaround plan to ramp up competition with its rivals. Shares hitting a six-month high after the German company confirmed first quarter preliminary results and its 2021 outlook showing customers are beginning to pick up spending after the pandemic cut back. I caught up with CEO Christian Klein earlier to get his forecast of the next half of the year. What we are observing is that the vaccination actually accelerates. Yeah? So of course, in the US, you already are ahead. In Europe, we are now falling and there will be also much more supply to come in the next month. So also here in half year two, actually, I expect that we are actually almost back to normal. In Asia, what we see both in Q1, but as well as in our pipeline, that the business is again already reaccelerating. So we are very confident about half year two. You can catch that full interview online. Um, shares of Intel, meantime, falling after hours after the world's biggest chip maker reported a fall in data center sales and steep drop in profits. Our Ed Ludlow joining us now with the latest. Ed, uh, walk us through the numbers that don't seem so good. Yeah. It's really pain in the data center business. Come straight with me into my Bloomberg and look at this chart because revenue at the data center business fell 20% from the same period last year. The issue is this is the center of profit. So when you see revenue come down, it impacts the overall margin. Gross margin coming in at around 52%. Intel is used to margins of 60%. So that's a significant decline. But there was some bright spots for Intel as well. You know, Emily, when we talk about semiconductors, a lot of it's very complicated. But the audience will remember Intel inside, all of the TV ads every time you've bought a laptop the sticker that's on the front and that's where Intel is doing well PC demand and laptop demand remain strong and it remains robust and Intel's outlook for the coming quarter the second quarter if we flip up the boards is pretty strong it sees revenue growth although profit might slightly shrink in the second quarter there is of course the ongoing global chip shortage there is obviously supply constraints that Intel is working through with some of its customers then the focus for analysts on the call is the foundry business remember the actual manufacturing of semiconductors is dominated by two names, Taiwan Semiconductor and Samsung in Korea. But Intel is putting its money where its mouth is, 20 billion in two new plants in Arizona, and it's got some fighting talk. CEO Pat Gelsinger saying to analysts on the call, we are here to win, we're going to be very competitive in our approach to market share, and we are going to gain market share. He says the company has already lined up 50 new potential customers who they will build chips for. And that's at a time when key customers like Apple, like Amazon, like Google, are designing their own chips and looking to those Korean names to manufacture for them. So real fighting talk on the call. And I know that you'll be speaking to the CEO tomorrow, Emily. Absolutely. Ed. Thanks so much. That's right. I'm going to be speaking with Pat Gelsinger, CEO, new CEO of Intel tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern time. You don't want to miss that conversation. Meantime, as global temperatures careen past critical levels, U.S. and China, they're locked in geopolitical and economic chess match have having been have been setting parallel and equally ambitious emissions goals. Bloomberg looks at whether climate change will turn the world's two biggest economies into unlikely allies or if there will be yet another conflict. China has an ambitious goal. While it currently accounts for one third of global emissions, President Xi has pledged China will be carbon neutral by 2060. Beijing plans to slow emissions growth, hitting a peak by 2030 by boosting non-fossil fuel sources and green tech, reducing pollution and pushing to, quote, electrify everything while hooking more industries up to carbon-free energy. 
Not to be outdone, U.S. President Joe Biden is aiming to beat China by a decade. He wants net zero emissions by 2050 and an emissions-free electric grid in 15 years. Both countries have picked key Paris Accord figures to lead their respective climate strategies. China's Xie Zhenhua has a record of deals with the United States. And while John Kerry initially took a swipe at Beijing's plans, he now says he hopes the U.S. can work with China. Parallel policies and key personnel could open up a new front of cooperation between the two economic giants. But Chinese diplomats have warned that working together will depend on Biden's stance on issues, including trade, Hong Kong and Taiwan. Those issues will never be traded for anything that has to do with climate. That's not going to happen. Besides the diplomatic balancing act, the two countries are also finding their own journeys to net zero problematic. Xie Jianhua acknowledges it will be an uphill battle. China's total coal use is still rising, and it needs to balance economic goals with reining in pollution, while partisan divisions in the United States may force Biden to compromise on big policy leaps. But whether the two major economies clash or collaborate, one thing is certain. Zeroing out emissions is a key aspiration for both. Are you talking about the last one? All right. Still ahead. A trio of Jack Dorsey, Kathy Wood, Elon Musk are promoting the idea that Bitcoin mining can actually incentivize renewable energy. We're going to speak to the CEO of the Bitcoin mining firm, Genesis Digital Assets, about the environmental impact of the operation and whether it can actually be good for our planet. Our Earth Day special coverage continues. And as we head to break, I want to take a look at Bitcoin falling to the $52,000 range. We're going to keep a close eye on the volatile play. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Bitcoin mining is often decried as an energy hog, but the new research results by Kathy Wood's ARC and Jack Dorsey Square have been found to, quote, debunk that myth. Tesla's Elon Musk also agrees it could actually be good for the planet, this despite the fact that the mining devours massive amounts of power. Citigroup saying in a recent report that Bitcoin mining now uses 66 times more electricity than in 2015. Joining us now to talk about the debate, Marco Streng, CEO and co-founder at Genesis Digital Assets, which aims to build the world's largest and most profitable mining operation by 2025. So, Marco, I spoke to Bill Gates uh, when he made that comment that he was concerned about how much energy Bitcoin mining is consuming. What is your reaction to the folks who say this is not good for the planet? Well, I think um, for, on that matter, I think there is one very important uh, thing to understand when it comes to the environmental and energy consumption on Bitcoin. And that basically is that Yes, it's true. Bitcoin miners are consuming a lot of energy. We're globally at around 9 to 10 gigawatts of global electricity consumption. Um, but what is actually far more important is um, what actually does that really mean and also where is this going? And I think um, the most important is that we are fortunate that um, on this planet, renewable energy sources are among the if not the most, uh, the most uh, um, economically uh, friendly and lowest cost sources of energy. So miners are driven by economy and uh, they are driven by, by profits and they will always go where, the, where they have lowest cost of power. And um, the okay. good thing on mining is that we, miners are not depending to be anywhere close to a civilization. They can be far out somewhere, like they can be in Alaska, they can be in, in Iceland, they can be in the north of Europe, close to the North Pole. And that actually creates a momentum, which also Elon Musk is referring to and Jack Dorsey, that effectively this is actually contributing in a beneficial way uh, to the renewable uh, renewables industry and and really, um, yeah, support the whole industry uh, itself by miners moving to the sources of cheap uh, renewable sources, renewable power. Yeah, I, I know some of your servers are in Iceland, um, so appreciate the explanation. We only have about 30 seconds left, Marco. So what kind of coins are you mining now 
and why? So, so we are since eight years now in this industry. Uh, we started in 2013, and we are mining um, fully. We, we are fully focused on Bitcoin mining, and we are there to power the decentralized future. And um, we actually um, we we think this is a very important component of all of that to basically power Bitcoin, the the open source monetary system, and that puts a, a lot of uh, burden and also a lot of responsibility on us as we are the largest uh, player uh, outside, of, outside of China. All right. Uh, Genesis Digital Assets CEO and co-founder Marco Streng, uh, certainly fascinating work that you are doing. We'll have you back to talk about this more another time um, and how you're working to make your operations sustainable. And that does it for this Earth Day edition of Bloomberg Technology. Again, you can tune in tomorrow when I'll be speaking with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger. That's coming up 11 a.m. Eastern time. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg.